Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kaya Henderson, and I lead the Global Learning Lab for Community Impact at Teach for All. Um, I'll be your moderator for this important and very timely panel discussion on learning poverty. Today's event is meant to shine a spotlight on the current global learning crisis and what it will take to actually end learning poverty. It's also End Poverty Day, so I'm excited to be here representing Teach for All. Teach for All is a global network of more than 50 independent organizations that are working together to develop collective leadership to ensure that all of our children have the opportunity to fulfill their potential. At Teach for All, we envision a world where educators, policymakers, parents, and students are working together to ensure that their community's children can shape a better future for themselves and for us all. And so, I'm excited to welcome not just the audience here, but also our online audience, since we're live streaming this panel discussion around the world. I want to remind you that you can follow us and ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag learningpoverty. As you can see on the piece there. Um, we're excited to take questions from you, and we're excited to open this conversation beyond this room and beyond Washington, because this is a global issue that requires a global solution. A couple of quick reminders before we start with our esteemed panel. This event will be in English, but one of our panelists, Minister Kane of Niger, will address us in French. We'll also have simultaneously, simultaneous interpretation in Arabic and Spanish. You should have a headset under your chair, and uh, you can access the translation through that headset. We have an exciting event and an impressive panel, and so without further ado, I want to introduce you to our exciting panelists. Um, <clears throat> we actually have from, uh, from Save the Children, Kevin Watkins, who's the chief executive of Save the Children UK. Next to him, we have Madame Achiatu Bulama Kane, the Minister of Planning from Niger. We have Henrietta Foray, the Executive Director of UNICEF. We have uh, Minister uh, Ken Aforiata, who's the Minister of Finance in Ghana. We have um, Annette Dixon, who is the Vice President of Human Development here at the World ba Bank. Um, and we have Ivo Ferreira Gomez, the mayor of Sobral, Brazil, who has an exciting story to share with us. Um, and we'll have a special guest that will join us on stage a little bit later. Um, but our final panelists is David Malpas, who is the president of the World Bank. We're so excited to have him here with us today. And I'd like to actually invite President Malpas to the stand to give us some opening remarks. Thank you, thank you very much. I get the best part, I get to announce the, uh, the new report, which I have here, and I'll show again at a later, uh, at a later moment. But uh, hello everyone, bon, bon, bonjour, uh, buongiorno. Um, for, for, for most children, uh, turning 10 is an exciting moment. They're learning more about the world and their social horizons are expanding, but more than half of all 10-year-olds in low and middle income countries can't read. That's unacceptable. Wiping out learning poverty, defined as the percentage of children who can't read and understand a basic story by the age of 10, is an urgent matter. It's a key to eliminating poverty in general and to boosting shared prosperity. It's a key to helping children achieve their potential. That's why we're setting a new target today of cutting in half, at least in half, the global level of learning poverty. 
learning is an essential component of human capital, which is an indicator of people's knowledge, skills, and health. A year ago, at the annual meetings in Bali, we launched the Human Capital Index, which tracks countries' progress in these areas. The index is part of the Human Capital Project, which seeks to galvanize nations to invest more and better in people. Why should countries invest in human capital? Because it's pivotal to improving development outcomes, alleviating, alleviating poverty, and advancing shared prosperity. It's piv pivotal to creating a quality of opportunity for everyone. We know that a critical factor in countries improving their human capital index number is to improve education outcomes and address shortcomings in access to education and more importantly to learning. Thanks to a new partnership with UNESCO, we're assembled We've assembled the most comprehensive data set measuring literacy. We now have a clear picture of the education challenge, especially when it comes to literacy. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the level of learning poverty is 87%. In Ida countries, the rate is 81%, underscoring why human capital is at the, at the core of our Ida commitments. Even in countries with relatively high incomes, such such as the Middle East and North Africa, learning poverty is above 60%. In Latin America, the, the figure is uh, just over 50%. These numbers are sobering. They underscore the need for action. At best, the learning poverty rate is on pace to fall to slightly more than 40%, even by 2030. That's an ominous sign for the education targets under the Sustainable Development Goals, which aim to provide quality education for all. Our target of cutting learning poverty is achievable, but it requires stepped-up cooperation and resources. We need to get to work now. Our new report uh, on ending learning poverty, released today, lays out how we can achieve this goal through three important steps. Learning interventions aimed at reading proficiency, systemic and sustained improvements in education systems, and number three, an ambitious measurement and research agenda. Several developing countries are showing that accelerated progress is possible. In Kenya, the government's national reading program has more than tripled the percentage of grade two students reading at an appropriate level. This was accomplished through technology-enabled teacher coaching, teacher guides, and the delivery of one book per child. In Egypt, the government has changed its curriculum and assessment systems, so students are evaluated throughout the year with exams that focus on acquiring skills. Teachers now receive coaching and peer learning opportunities, but the key element of the reforms has been a shift toward learning, not to get a credential. Uh, it's great to hear that Egypt will be hosting a regional ministerial conference next year on learning poverty. And in Vietnam, there is a lean, effective curriculum that ensures the, that basics are covered. Teachers ensure deep learning of the fundamental skills, and all children have reading materials. Learning outcomes of Vietnamese students in, in the bottom 40% of the income ladder are as high or higher than the average OECD student. Tackling this crisis will require a new level of commitment and comprehensive reforms, including fiscal reforms, to ensure domestic resources are used as effectively as possible, investing in better teaching and improving coordination among stakeholders. Meeting this new learning poverty target won't be easy, but we can't back down from the challenge. We owe it to the children of this world to set our sights high so they can too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. I'm, I, I, I have to go on, but I'm really looking forward to the results of the panel. Thanks, Would everybody. Would you join us for a quick picture for the panel? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Panelists, can you? We'll take care of this very quickly. If you can just stand up and we'll.
Yun step up. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So as you already know, and as we just heard, um, we've made a lot of progress in recent decades, um, as more children are in school than ever before, but millions of children still can't read or write, even after several years of schooling. The result is that these inequalities are widening sharply instead of narrowing, and we're failing generations of children. Um, for far too many of, of our children, the world kind of looks like this. Not that. Uh, <laughs> The, the world looks, <laughs> the world looks crazy, scribble scrabbly, un, uncomprehensible, unintelligible, right? And we want it to look, so, right, it looks, we wanna, whatever. It doesn't look the way it's supposed to look and we wanna get it to looking right. So, um, I want to uh, pause for a minute, we have a, Film that we're not showing a film. They are testing my, listen, let's just have the panel. Let's do this. Um, here we go. I wanna start with Henrietta at UNICEF. Um, we've just heard President Malpas talk about the urgency of the learning crisis and what needs to be done to tackle it. You, like me, are a human capital champion and you are leading, a, a leading global advocate on education. How does this call to focus um, on reading help galvanize our actions towards sustainable development goal number four. Thank you, sister human capital <laughs> champion. Um, so, so when you actually think about reading and what we're doing today, this is the most important part of your life. So all of us in this room know how to read. You can read paragraphs, you can read pamphlets on your, on your uh, chairs, you can read signs, street signs. But much of this world cannot, millions of people cannot read. So if you could give them a gift for this coming century, knowing how to read would be immensely important and being able to comprehend it. So I think most of you know that the class of 2030 is already in second grade. So there is no time to waste. What President Malpass was just telling all of us, that the time is now, this is urgent, there is a learning crisis in the world. So, so that one, we all need to leave this room and just say clearly to everyone that we meet. Uh, when we look at it from UNICEF's point of view, there are a couple of areas that we think that we know about as a world and we could build on. One is early childhood development. It's an area that with the World Bank and Annette we have often talked about, but it is something that we think is very achievable. So couldn't every country in the world have at least one year of early childhood development before children enter into school? If they could, it means children would be readier to learn, ready to absorb what they are going to hear about how to read. The second is this wonderful goal that we now all have, that by age 10, you can read and comprehend a paragraph. So if you could do that by the end of primary school, that would be remarkable and important. The third is that we have lots of young people who are adolescents, who because of violence or crises of some sort, have been out of school as you all know, we have millions who are out of school. The um, entire population of Brazil is the equivalent in the world today. So these children often need to catch up. They need accelerated learning programs. We've got accelerated programs that are working in a number of countries. But you know, you remember what it was like when you were a child. If you're 16 and you can't read, you are kind of ashamed and you don't want to go back and read. But we've got to get them back into school. And then... Um, Lastly, it's going to be really important that young people are able to learn some skills when they're at school. If we could do those four things, this idea of learning poverty, we could overcome it, and we could overcome it by 2030. So go, everyone in this room. Let's be a team. Let's be human capital champions. 
Thank you, Henrietta. <laughs> minister of Foriata, I must say that I was thrilled when they said there was going to be a minister of finance on the panel, um, because I say all the time that educators cannot do this alone, right? It takes everybody. And so you have a huge challenge in that you have to provide basic services to all Ghanaian children. How much do you think this is about getting more resources, and how much do you think this is about using the existing resources more effectively? Thank you very much. I, I feel really loved knowing that it's because of my money that I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, But that's my headache. Um, so, I mean, the, our government attaches, you know, great importance to, to the issue of education. And when we came into government in January of 2017, um, the president announced his vision of um, free senior high school education for everyone. Um, that, of course, um, was colossal in terms of what it meant for the budget. Uh, it's not cheap. Um, but he was very clear about the issue um, of social justice and access for everyone. Um, and that is a, is a country's responsibility to make that happen. Um, looking back, we are now spending about 28.9% of government expenditure on education yeah. and 6% of the GDP almost um, on that. Um, I think last year, um, coming to this year, we had another 20% increase um, um, for the ministry. Um, and the results have been stunning. We've had about 290,000 new kids get into senior high school wow. who would never have had a prayer of a chance um, to be there um, to discover their God-given um, talents um, and really the liberty um, to have a life um, of dignity. Um, uh, so we've had to also be really creative because now um, the, the infrastructure is straining. Uh, now we have a 2.5% um, portion of VAT, VAT, that we give to the Ghana Education Trust Fund. Um, so the ministry, um, with the support of education, got very innovative about it and securitized those proceeds so that we have an additional $1.5 billion um, dollars equivalent that we are using for infrastructure um, to support that. But I, I think um, the, the, the new commitment really now has to be um, what we do with teachers and, and parent involvement, mm -hmm. um, because I think that's, that's going to be the key to that. Uh, but of all of these numbers, you know, the, there's a big but to it. Um, so sort of the average education, maybe 11 and a half years, um, but effectively um, about five years of that you know, can be calculated to be um, to be really effective. So we we need to work on that. Our HCI is about 0.44, which means um, therefore there's quite a bit of loss by the time these kids are, are much older. Um, but I think it's it's, it's non-negotiable. Uh, we have to find the means to to fund it. Um, but we truly have to look at quality understand our own sociology of learning and engagement um, to make sure um, that all these kids uh, have an opportunity um, for the future. Yeah. Because I think it is that base. I mean, for Ghana, from independence, um, President Nkrumah was very clear about education. And so our legacy of educated people um, you know, supporting other African countries and ourselves is really high. We went down a bit. And, and now the new impetus from the new president, um, I think we're going to regain and get people back on the block. So I hear you saying leadership matters, right? From the beginning of, of independence of the country to the current president, a real priority around an investment in education. I hear creativity. You didn't say there's not enough money, right? You said we had to be creative about how to leverage these resources. And um, you talked about quality, which I think is really, really important. Not enough to just throw money or throw a vision at this work. We've got to really double down on quality. Um, that's exciting. I wish you could But do I think a it's a choice. OK. You know? and, and you have to make a determination that our people are the center of the society and to create unity and um, to ensure that the future 
Uh, it's a sustainable and robust and dynamic society. You have to do that. I know, we're gonna make him do a commercial for us on human <laughs> capital, right? <laughs> Um, can you talk about, I mean, perfect segue, can you talk about the bank's advice on investing in people and why these, uh, this investing in better education has impacts far beyond just the children who are currently in school? Well, I think, I think on this panel and this room, we all agree that it's morally unacceptable and it's really bad public policy that half the children in the developing world can't read by the age of 10. Now, you know, there's been, as Ken said, there's been a huge effort to get kids into school, but now we've got to get them learning. And getting them to read is actually foundational to everything else. You know, uh, a couple of times in the last few weeks I've been asked, but why did you just choose reading? Because aren't other things important too? And that's true. But if a kid can't read, she won't get math, she won't get science, she won't get civics, she won't be able to participate fully as a citizen in the society. So it is the key, the, the foundation to all of the other things that we say are important in human capital. Now, as a Minister of Finance, Ken's first problem is he doesn't even know how many kids, 10-year-old kids in Ghana can read. So that's his first problem, is to get the data to actually know. And a lot of, a lot of uh, countries have actually made a huge effort in good faith and allocated a huge amount of resources. He's, he's, he's a living example of a very committed Minister of Finance. 6% of GDP is fantastic. But now we actually have to focus on making sure that we're getting the results for that money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think... You know, uh, if you get this right, you will get a lot of other things in, in education right. So if you focus on literacy, the, the learning impact will be much broader than just focusing on learning. So I think it's a, it, it's a very sound economic choice to focus on literacy uh, in, in, in the first place, to get everything else working that needs to happen for schools to really work well. Kevin. Um, let me invite you into the conversation. So politicians, policymakers, the Amen Chorus says this is important. We know that these only one in two young people can read by the age of 10 or can't. Um, and so what is that telling us and how do we create a sense of urgency around this? Why aren't we getting it right now if everybody knows that this is a priority? Thanks, Kaya. The three really small questions there. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll have a go with them. But I, f first of all, I wanted to say a huge thank you, actually, to Annette and the World Bank team, because I, I think th this is really addressing what is such a crunch issue for the 2030 goals, because the simple reality is that if we fail on this, we fail on everything. We fail on the poverty targets, on the child survival targets. So there's a lot riding on getting this right. What, one of the things, Kai, that you, actually you bring to this panel is your incredible passion for education. And I have to say, in my day job, I get to meet a lot of children that we're talking about here, actually children who are living in slums, their parents. Um, and actually, I was in North Kivu in Democratic Republic of Congo recently, and I met a young boy whose name was Mark, 12 years old, who was selling charcoal at the side of the road in the morning to, fi to finance going to school in the afternoon. And what I think that's a microcosm of the ambition and the energy and the innovation that parents and children that we're talking about here bring to the education challenge. And what I would say to everybody in this room, you know, we come from different countries, different backgrounds, we have different views. The one thing we've got in common, as Henrietta said, is we've got education. And if you try and imagine, your, try this as a thought experiment, try imagining your life if you'd been robbed of your right to read by the age of 10, how would, what would your life be like now? Imagine you couldn't read to your children, you hadn't had an opportunity to go to secondary school. Obviously, it would be different. So I, th I think you know, we, we need a bit of empathy here to recognize what's at stake. Now, the three big questions, what, what does it tell us? Question one, uh, I'm afraid it tells the world's children that adults are great at pitching up at conferences, mm -hmm. including conferences like this, mm -hmm. and UN summits, and setting soaring ambition and breaking the promise 
and then coming back a few years later and repeating the exercise. Mm -hmm. So we need to cut that cycle. That is a really critical thing. We all have a responsibility for doing that. What, what is going wrong? The, the, there's an awful lot of things going wrong. I'm going to pick out three really quickly. Henriette is completely right on the importance of early childhood. The damage is done before children get into school. One in three children in developing countries start school carrying the burden of malnutrition. That is not a prospect for learning. So we've, we've got to get more children into an early learning environment. Secondly, learning is ultimately a relationship between teachers and children. And you know, in, in Africa, we know from a new report, I think which came out today from the Education Commission, there's a shortage of 17 million teachers in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, it's not just a question of more teachers. You need teachers who can teach first-generation learners, teachers who can teach not by rote, but with passion and through play and through real engagement with teacher. Third thing we're getting wrong, and I just want to put this on the table, honestly, is inequality and equity. You know, if you look at this country, vast parts of this country are being left behind. It's exactly the same in the countries that we're talking about. Now, unless we get more equitable public spending to close these gaps, we're going to be pitching up here in three years' time having exactly the same discussion mm -hmm. we're having now. So I, I think one of the things in terms of what we can do about it, um, what, you know, what, one of the big learning things for me in Save the Children is, is that it's a smart thing to listen to children. And actually, most of the children who I come into contact with, whether it's in primary school or secondary school, will have a pretty good shot at working out what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they need teachers who know how to teach them. <coughs> they need female teachers because female teachers are role models. And they need a bit of joy in education because education can be a joyful experience. It can be a miserable experience if, like Thomas Gradgrind in Hard Times, you, you treat children as empty vessels that you pour facts into. So there's too much pouring of facts, not enough engagement. We need to change the way we recruit teachers and train teachers and make education a joy to learn. Kevin, I mean, thank you. Minister Kanye, I'm really excited to have you with us as well. Um, you are a minister of planning in Niger. And again, right, it takes all of us, um, not just educators. And so as you think about your planning responsibilities and you think about the funding that has already been prioritized in education in Niger, you still face enormous challenges. Sue, how do you see the improvement of educational quality through your country? And if you could pay special attention to this issue of girls' education, we'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. I see that as soon as you announced that I would speak, people have uh, caught their headphones to listen to the interpretation. Thank you for this question. And first, for inviting me, inviting us to this panel. This panel is crucial, of vital importance for me. In Niger, since 2011, we have turned education into a priority to the extent that we have decided to dedicate 25 percent, that's the goal, 25 percent of the budget should be dedicated to education. But in 2012, uh, sorry, in Yes, in 2012, we had a security crisis, so security took over as a priority. In spite of everything, in 2018, Niger dedicates 22% of its budget to education, although 17% of the budget had to be dedicated to security. So we made an enormous effort, but that 22%, although a high figure, hides something. It hides the fact that with the 22%, we can only enroll half of the children. 600,000 children want to go to school in our country, but with this 22 percent, 
we can only enroll 300,000. So this is a situation where 55% of our children don't go to school. That's a separate challenge for learning. But among those who go to school, we still have problems. We have problems because a large part of those children cannot read. I'll give you some figures. 24% of the children in the fourth year of primary school, after four years, they cannot read 24%. In the sixth level, 8.5% only can read. So our educational system is highly vulnerable, both in terms of access and of quality and efficiency. And I'll speak of uh, girls in school also. As far as quality is concerned, we really have attacked the problem to find a solution. And to repeat what was already said by President Malpass, in order to have well-educated children, you need good teachers. So we are going to insist on the quality of teachers, of how to give quality support to teachers. We also have to take measures to improve the quality of teaching through digital means. As I don't have much time, let's now speak of girls' education. We've done already quite some efforts, but we still have a deficit as far as girls' education is concerned. We try to overcome this through vigorous measures taken in 2017. It was a reform that gave priority to girls' schooling, and especially not only schooling, but retention, that is to keep the girls in school, because many girls abandon school. They drop out while it's in secondary school, or at least the first 10 years of schooling, well, then whole life can be changed. I'll come back to this later on. Thank you. So what I hear is um, it's not just, even when you have vision, and you set education as a priority, even when you um, add resources at really significant levels, we still have not cracked the access problem, right? There are still young people who need to get into school. And again, this thread that runs through, we have to pay attention to the quality of what's happening. Because even when kids are in school, um, they are not learning the way they need to learn. Um, I'm excited to introduce a contrarian to this problem. Uh, <laughs> mayor Gomez, who is the mayor of Sobral, Brazil, and was the secretary of education before becoming mayor. Um, and um, your municipality was actually 1,366th in the nation. And over the course of some time, you raised that to taking the number one position in education for three years in a row. Yes, we should applaud for that. <clears throat> so we all want to know, what did you do? How did you do it? How do we do it? What does it take in five minutes or in less? five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Congratulations to the World Bank for addressing this this problem. Finally, we have an international powerful voice right. on this problem of reading. <clears throat> reading is not uh, something that you are born with disability, so it's a creation of human culture. So we need a technique and a lot of work for this. But anyway, 22 years ago, uh, the political group I belong to came into power in Sobral, which is in the the fourth city 
uh, largest city in Ceará, which is one of the poorest states in the in the country, in a very dry region in the northeastern of Brazil. And uh, when this group came into power, <clears throat> we were decided to uh, bring every child to school. By then, we had like 30% of our children outside of school. So uh, during the four first years, we believed we were doing exactly what was necessary to be done to provide places for everybody and good education for everybody. At the end of the fourth year, we hired uh, uh, a group of teachers to assess the reading uh, <clears throat> level of our children. And uh, it was a huge disappointment for us because we thought we were, we were doing great. <laughs> but at the end, we just realized that spending money and great efforts and love and care was not enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, we deepened the assessment, and then we assessed the, uh, all the children and teenagers at the school to find out that uh, by the ninth grade, about 50% of the kids couldn't read mm -hmm. a paragraph. So uh, we never, for us, that we are not teachers, we are politicians, it was a huge surprise. We were like looking at each other and saying, oh my God, how, can, how, how is it possible that somebody is at the ninth grade and they cannot read? And if they can't read, somebody before me said they, they cannot learn uh, anything else. So reading is the basic skill that we have to um, uh, help the schools to provide. So um, we separated at that time, we separated all the kids from first grade to ninth grade in two uh, classes, different classes, classrooms, not classes, uh, into classrooms of kids that could read and kids that could not read. Mm -hmm. So to guarantee that the kids that could read, that they could move on, and the kids that could not read, we had to separate them and teach them to read. Okay. And then we realized that they cannot read, they could not read because the teachers were not capable of teaching them how to read mm -hmm. because it's a very complicated uh, function and the most important function of the school. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, the teachers could not give what they, couldn't, what they didn't have to give. So uh, we had to start a massive program of teaching teachers how to teach kids to read. Mm -hmm. So um, there were some, for that, that was a substantial change we had to do, but there was a premise before that because by then the politicians loved the positions of schools, like, like principals <laughs> and teachers and pedagogical coordinators. So I think w the biggest contribution our group of politicians made for our education was to protect the school against politicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only politicians can do that, right, right, in democracies. Right. So uh, <laughs> from that on, all the principals and teachers and pedagogical coordinators were selected by meritocratic um, criteria. And uh, oh my god, 30 seconds. I haven't even. <laughs> I'm still in the fifth year. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, this assessment you said in the rank of Brazil, uh, like we are in the first, in the first position, is the, the position in the fifth and ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And we only got that because 100% of our kids can read by the age of seven mm -hmm. years old now. Mm -hmm. Well, well We'll talk, a little, we'll talk a little bit more about what it takes, because I think people are itching to really know. Um, but I want to take a little break and shift. Um, at Teach For All, we, we've learned that the people closest to the problem often have the best solutions. And Ken sort of lifted it up when he said, ask students what they need to see in schools. They actually know the answer. And so uh, we want to take a break from our esteemed panel of experts to hear from a real expert. Um, I want to introduce you today to Angela, who's a student activist who came all the way from Albania to share her perspective with us on this issue around learning poverty. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. 
Hello everyone, I am Angela, 16 years old from Northeast Albania, one of the poorest area where poverty and employment dominate. In my country, children make up over 35% of the Albanian population. Over 20% of children live in absolute poverty. Poverty is widespread phenomenon and is on the rise. Poverty affects children's success in progress in school. 83.3% uh, uh, of children consider poverty, exclusion, and disability of as areas of particular concern. Another barrier to education is violence against children in school. Based on Save the Children's Young Voice report, children are still affected by widespread violence, violence in Albanian society. 58% of the interviewed children have seen someone punched or hit in the past year. Public transportation and school buses are unsafe places for children. Another concern is the fact that, is the fact that not, all the, not, not all children feel secure and protected in the classroom. One in ten children does not feel safe in the class. Almost one-third of children have fit bullet or hair raised during the last two school terms. Unfortunately, the education system and the whole of Albanian society are not prepared to cope with bullying. Almost 40% of children report that they don't know or are unsure on where to turn when they feel violated or unfairly treated. Another barrier for children is that they are often prevented from participating in decision-making processes. Their opinions are frequently not taken into consideration. In order to overcome these barriers, I work with my peers in a child-led group. Its mission is to empower children and have their rights respected in school, the family and the community. At the school level, we have led campaigns on the, on the importance of children's education, focusing on girls' empowerment and children's participation in school activities and life. We have established Children's Rights Club, where girls and boys freely engage in dialogue and exchange their ideas, opinions, and matter of concern for them. We promote children's participation in school decision-making. At the community level, we advocate to municipal authorities to improve children's rights, situation focusing children's safety in school, school infrastructure, quality of education, children's participation, and primary health care for children. We have lobbied to local authorities to become part of the municipal consul consultative meetings convening, ch convening children's rights. We have also worked on a project called Under Radio, which is the first ever web platform for and by children. It aims to encourage children to express freely and speak out on issues important to them. At the national level, we have done research, in, research and monitoring reports for children's rights. Recently, we work with the State Agency for the Rights and Protection of the Child, as well as the Child Rights Ombudsman, to launch a national criteria of children participation in decision making. We have also successfully lobbied to appoint the first ever Commissioner of Child Rights Protection and Promotion. And though we have, achieved a lo we have achieved a lot as children, there is still a lot more to do. We need children to have access to quality education. They need opportunities to be part of activities where they can be equipped with new skills that will help them to go on to higher education and find a job after school. They also need access to free transportation to and from school. We need safety for children in school. The government, school authorities, teachers and parents need to work together to ensure that children are safe and protected in school and on their way to school. We need to ensure children's right to participate at all levels, in school, in the community, and in decision-making processes. Policymakers need to ensure that children's opinions and views are taken into account and influence policies that concern children and youth. I've talked about these issues that affect me and my peers in Albania, and also other youth around the world. What we want from you all, as leaders, is to listen to our voices and support our education as a priority. Children and youth, and youth are the future. When we are educated, we are the ones who can make change and make the world better. Thank you all for yeah. listening. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We, 
At Teach For All, we often talk about preparing students to lead for a better future. And we think about, I think as adults, we think about children leading 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when they are adults. But these young people are ready to lead right now. She told you what the barriers were. She showed you that when kids read, kids lead, right? And she told you a bunch of different policy issues that you can tackle. She told you what interventions you need to be doing. We need to let these young people get in front of us and lead. I could preach on this, but we have a video to go to or something. Yeah, right, video. Now you're ready. <laughs> Reading and understanding is the foundation upon which all learning is built. Children need to be proficient in reading while they're in primary school to develop numeracy, build the fundamentals of basic science, or learn key social-emotional skills such as communications or teamwork. In most high-income countries, almost all children learn to read by the fourth grade. In low- and middle-income countries, however, more than half of children cannot read and understand a short story by the time they are finishing primary school. This situation is both morally and economically unacceptable. Eliminating learning poverty, the share of children who cannot read and understand by age 10 over the next decade is a critical development objective that must be confronted in the same way we aspire to eliminate hunger, stunting, and extreme poverty. We need a learning revolution to achieve the sustainable development goals. Aligned with these goals, the World Bank is setting a new ambitious but achievable learning target to ensure that by 2030, the share of children who cannot read at age 10 is reduced by at least half. From there, our ambition is to work with countries and other development partners to bring that number to zero. This is part of the World Bank's broader strategy to improve education outcomes by ensuring that 1. Children are prepared and motivated to learn 2. Teachers at all levels are effective and valued 3. Classrooms are equipped for learning with smart use of technology 4. Schools are safe and inclusive spaces 5. Education systems are well managed all children everywhere should have access to a quality education for which literacy is the foundation. Vietnam, Kenya, Brazil are among the countries where targeted efforts have achieved impressive gains in literacy. They show that a learning revolution is possible. Join the learning revolution. Follow us at WBG underscore education. Alrighty, friends, a learning revolution. We gotta make it happen, right? And we gotta make it happen in three minutes this time, not five. So, uh, Minister Kane, um, in order to hit those five big goals that we just talked about, uh, we need national objectives, we need a national plan. You talked um, compellingly about how Niger set out clear objectives. Um, what kind of implement, implementation challenges? Can you continue to talk a little bit about that and what support you need from other ministries in order to um, get to the objectives of your national plan? Thank you. So, indeed, we have objectives, we have targets specific targets for schooling and also for education of girls and also for literacy. These targets are part and parcel of our development strategies, that is our economic and social development plan. And if you think of literacy. There is another aspect to education, which is literacy. 70% of the population of Niger is illiterate. So only 29% is literate, especially illiteracy is predominant in the rural areas especially. In Niger, we have 50% of our population that is less than 15 years old. So imagine that the 70% of illiterate people are mainly young people 
and especially young women. But our development strategy aims at education and literacy. And as far as literacy is concerned, we want to double the number of literate people by 2021. It's ambitious, but we want to get there. And I think it will be possible because we have a plan to speed up literacy with a literacy policy. What do we do? Well, we make sure that literacy be part of all sectoral programs. For instance, an agricultural program has a literacy aspect. Health programs, education programs, all development areas include a literacy facet. All projects that we start with the World Bank include literacy. We even have a specific project called employment for youth in rural areas includes literacy. But let's come back to quality. Well, there we have insisted very much with all our partners, and particularly the World Bank, that we want to launch a major program that will really improve quality. It's a program that we call Lire, Read, to read. But the acronym is also L-I-R-E, learning, which means Lire, Read in French. And I want to congratulate the Brazilian mayor because they're working there in the same direction that we want to go. You need quality teachers, and that's what we want to achieve in the LEAR program. The schools that teach teachers have to make sure that teachers are of quality. Only then will they be able to teach children well. And I will finish now because there is no more time. Thank you. All the research shows us that the quality of the teacher is the greatest in-school factor for moving student achievement, right? So Evo, teachers at the heart of the education system, tell us how teachers were at the heart of your reform. Teachers at the very heart of education without teachers, happy teachers, well-prepared teachers, loving teachers, happy teachers, will never have good education. Uh, so uh, we have to do everything to uh, <clears throat> arrange an environment, a teaching environment for them. And Brazil is the land sometimes of the nonsense things. <laughs> so uh, I'm not talking badly about my country, but uh, I say there too. But you know, if you have, if you ha if you are a teacher in Brazil now, uh, you have to go to college to learn how to be a teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, most of these courses prepare teachers for the uh, elementary school and the primary school, and. Uh, the the main function of a teacher at for this time of the kids is to teach them how to read That's right. and the four uh, how to say math Science. operations yes uh, that's that was that's what we expect the, the kids that by the end of the of the fifth grade to finish reading uh, a short story and being able to operate the basic four math. Base mac, basic math. And the universities in Brazil, guess what? They do not prepare teachers for that. So uh, when the teachers are hired by the government, the government has got to do everything again and spend all the same amount of money again mm. to prepare mm. the teachers to face the hard work of the classroom because it's very difficult to deal you know, with the... You know, with the uh, poor areas, rural areas, uh, schools. So uh, we have a very aggressive program, permanent program of uh, teaching teachers uh, at service, like every on every on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. We have a school for uh, teaching in, in Sobral, 
uh, for teachers. So uh, when they come into the into the our our schools, they have like 20 percent of their time a week. They have to go to this school. Mm -hmm. So and they have always been. Uh, going through new programs and new curriculum and uh, they have, they receive m extra money for the outcomes of their kids by the end of the year, which in the beginning was a good thing. It was something that was encouraging, but now s the their self-esteem is so high that they don't even care about the money. Of course, they love money. Who doesn't? <laughs> But uh, the recognition of the society, of the government, of the press, of the kids, for them is much more important than what they receive uh, as money. <laughs> okay, um, now we are developing a new curriculum of Portuguese, mathematics, and science. And uh, the teachers are again being invited to participate in the construction of the curriculum along with other professionals and uh, they you should when you go there you, you you see that when they go to the to the parties they dress up and they go to you know to just make their hair and they're proud they dress, they are very proud and we are very proud of them too nice i mean this the the Improving teacher practice is what we've heard as a theme throughout this. And the nonsense in Brazil is not just Brazilian nonsense, yeah, right? It is international nonsense. Uh, I think the next time we have this panel or as we continue this conversation, we have to have universities sitting here because we are wasting money, right, by sending people to university and then having to teach them all over again when they come into our schools and school districts, right? Um, Please do that, <laughs> <laughs> because it's amazing. We have been screaming. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, yeah, no, we have listen. been screaming in the state. Uh, the state of, of Sierra has heard us, the government. The Brazilian national government used to hear us, but they don't anymore. But the university never heard. That's right. It seems that they have nothing to do with that. Yeah. The it's our money. It's the taxpayers' money, because the most important universities in Brazil are public. Yeah. I don't know in the other countries, but in Brazil, they're public, they're financed by our money, and they pretend that the problem is not theirs. I'm sorry. <laughs> we could have a whole nother panel about that. <laughs> um, let's see, who should we go to next? Uh, let's go to Kevin. Um, we have laid out a zillion different challenges, and this seems immense and sort of impossible. Um, how can we as an international community do better? Um, how can the international development community coordinate to help countries take on this really important work? Well, I, I think I, I should say um, in the UK, of course, we have no nonsense at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I want to make it absolutely clear that is a bipartisan statement. <laughs> um, so, so look, I think there are a few things we need to do more and better. So we need more and better leadership. Mm -hmm. And I Can think you say that was, one more time? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it was great that this morning we had the president of the World Bank putting education right at the heart That's of right. an agenda for redistributive growth and reduced inequality for the whole Sustainable Development Goal project. That is a great step forward. You know, we have Gordon Brown, who is a you know, fantastic UN champion for education. I know how passionate Henrietta is about education and everybody on this panel. But, you know, le leadership has to be built and prompted and persuaded. And that's why it's so important that young people are making the demands that leaders will have to respond to. Second thing we need is more and better finance. You know, there is a big financing gap globally for what we're trying to achieve. Much, much of it has to be filled through a national effort. But it's not just a question of more money, it's how the money is spent. And too often we find situations in which the students who are most advantaged, who carry with them into school the least disadvantage, you know, the disadvantage that comes with malnutrition, with having an illiterate parent, maybe with being disabled, these are the children who are getting the least per capita spending Whereas the children who live in more affluent areas with literate parents are having more spent on them. That is the opposite 
yeah. of what should happen. So I would really encourage the World Bank as part of the commitment to equity, set out where does the money go? Okay. You know, is the money going to the communities that need it most or is it being skewed in the wrong direction? The third thing we, we need uh, more and better is data. And you know, we could discuss this for a long time, but the really simple bit of data we need is about closing the gaps. You know, there's a clear commitment in the Sustainable Development Goals that those furthest from the goals will make more rapid progress than those closest to the goals. That is a measurable proposition. Right. So let's report on the convergence between the learning outcomes for the poor and the learning outcomes for the wealthy. Uh, last thing we need more and better of, and I've got 30 seconds, so i, I say this really quickly. We just need to get better at listening to children. Mm -hmm. And all of my colleagues up here have said great things, but actually the most moving thing was listening to my colleague from Save the Children. And I don't, I don't make that as a statement to promote Save the Children. It's that you know, children are so passionate and they understand the stakes here in a way that, you know, I think we, we try to as well and we understand it, but they live it yeah. and they breathe it. And I think we have to create more platforms for children to tell their story, to make their demands. And you, they get this human capital stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they may not have read the economics, but they get it in a really fundamental way. So it's great that the rest of us have caught up on human capital, but I think you know, the, the children are the group that we need to listen to more than anybody else as we take this project forward. Thanks. Henrietta, how can advocacy and on the ground work help make a difference? Uh, well, it, uh, it could make a lot of difference. So um, one of the things, I, in listening to Kevin, uh, I'm struck that one of the things we have going for us is that lots and lots of young people around the world are now going to primary school. I mean, when you think about the 1950s, only 50% of the children were actually in primary school. And now that number is 9%. So it is that we've, we've got an asset there. Therefore, when you begin talking about advocacy for teachers and for uh, governments, we actually have children in school. But to Annette's point, what we have, though, is this learning poverty. The quality of the education is not good. So, so that's what the advocacy has to really get to now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, could I pick up on uh, a couple of things that I saw in the World Bank uh, video, one of which was the importance of... Um, young people and children actually uh, being motivated to learn. I think this is something that we haven't spent enough time on. And part of it is what Kevin's saying, you know, we who are older went through school systems where we listened, the teacher spoke to us, we read our books, and that's how we learned. That's not how young people want to learn now. And Angela was really terrific about this. They want to engage with us. They want to talk with us. They talk much more than we did. We were respectful and somewhat silent in our, <laughs> we were hoping not to be called on. Yeah. But, but that's- I ever were. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not now. So being motivated to learn is really important. And the comments about bullying, for many children that are in primary school, if you've been bullied or um, you've, you've been, and you feel miserable when you're in class, you're not gonna pay attention to literacy, to learning what that paragraph in front of you means. So I think there are many parts to this, but I think the motivation, the participation on our part is going to be a very key, important part of this. It's also that uh, when I listen to Annette and Kevin, they're talking about education being foundational. It is also the ladder out of poverty. And if we think about that, what the World Bank is launching today is something that all of us should be on this ladder with the young people and the children. Thank you. Thanks. Minister Aforiata, education is the ladder out of poverty. Um, that means a lot in a country like Ghana. How do we find, even as we improve the quality of teaching, there are going to be increased expenditures. How do you think about supporting this continued investment in education? Um, thank you. Um, once again, more money, is that right? More money. So let's see. Anything worth having is worth paying for, <laughs> Minister. Um, it's, um, we do have to get you know, more efficient um, with that, but I'm, I'm really hopeful um, with regards to, you know, where we are with regards to the ten-year-olds, etc. Um, and that's simply because 
I didn't get a good education until after 10. And so if I sit here today, I can't be pessimistic about it. And I need to find a way to you know, support, encourage, and know that they can all be like us sitting here um, today. Um, on the issue of um, financing, um, I mean, I'm hoping that we'll get more IDA replenishment, and then we can put more into that. So uh, <laughs> I think IDA went from 37 billion in um, IDA 17 to 75 billion, IDA 18, and they are playing around of 85 billion for IDA 19. I think it should go to 100 billion. Oh, what do we say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll do that. Um, and I think that will be used, you know, with good, with good input. Um, but there are a few things that we can also do. I mean, in terms of Africa, for example, the issue of carbon credits pricing. You know, if we can move it from two dollars a ton to the seventy-five or hundred dollars a ton, that it should be now bringing incredible capital for us to support that. Um, recently, on October 9th, the OECD came up again with the whole restructuring um, of taxes um, for multinationals, which is kind of really upending um, the old um, basis of physical presence as a means of taxation and changing that. And that will increase the amount of resources that um, um, developing countries have um, to support that. We also have quite a bit of illicit and financial flows, uh, which we need to be able to capture um, to, to support that. Um, so I think with a, with, a, with a global platform and the type of leadership uh, that Gordon Brown is also bringing into the finance, and uh, we should be able to begin a new narrative um, and create that coalition um, to, push, to push that agenda. Um, so I think, yes, efficiency, et cetera. Uh, but I think maybe um, in addition to all of this, for countries such as Ghana, we have a very strong uh, diaspora community outside of the countries um, who have benefited from great education. And we need to create a diaspora bond of some sort mm -hmm. uh, which will be targeted towards education. Uh, and I think that that could also go uh, a long way to, to support it. Um, but, but I truly... I'm optimistic. I think we can do it. Uh, just a commitment um, of leadership, um, especially from the presidency. And for Ghana, we also have an incredibly dynamic minister of education, which then, you know, makes it less painful to sign those checks. <laughs> uh, Annette, Kevin said that we sit around at conferences like this and we make big lofty goals and we break the promise. Um, how is this new approach going to make real change? Are these targets feasible? Like, how are we going to get countries to take action so that this is not another one of those empty cycles? Well, I think all of us are here because we're optimistic. And the first thing to say is we know we can do it because we see the results we're already getting. You know, we're the largest financing partner to countries, um, and we're one of uh, many uh, aid partners who help the poorest countries in the world. Um, and we see the results. There are more teachers being trained, more schools being built, more textbooks being provided as we speak. So that is happening. Um, but it needs to happen a lot faster, and now we need to really double down on the learning part of it. So getting the kids into school is a necessary precondition, but it's not enough in itself. Um, and we certainly need more IDA, because the poorest countries in the world have fast-growing populations, so we actually are going backwards in some cases, because we're just not running fast enough to actually provide places for enough kids. Um, and a lot of these countries are fragile, and the kids' education is interrupted, and we are getting more uh, uh, persistent and committed to keeping kids in school no matter their situation, if they're displaced in countries that are actually in conflict and so on, and we do that together with all of the partners uh, here. Um, but I think 
Most importantly, it needs real political grit and commitment. And, and you know, Kaya, you've done this in the District of Columbia, you know it, Mayor Gomez, um, and I think all the, all the people on this panel uh, know it too. You know, it, it's not enough to get the kids turning up well nourished and stimulated. That's the start, you need the kids there. And some kids have got to walk you know, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours to get to school. It takes a lot to motivate a kid to go every day if they're hungry and they have to walk a long way. So that's the first condition. The second is the teachers and to get teachers that have pedagogical skills to teach reading who show up and are motivated takes a lot of political commitment. Um, and a lot of it comes back to how valued the teachers are. The third is, is, the, is the tools, and, and you know, for reading, the basic tool is a book that's age appropriate in the language that's spoken in the child's home. That's, that's the precondition. Then two other things which Angela talked about. One is schools have to be safe and inclusive. Kids do not learn, they do not come if they're afraid of being beaten, afraid of being bullied, afraid of being exploited by their teacher who asks for sex for grades, um, and if uh, the toilets are not clean and functioning. These are all the basic conditions. But most importantly, every child should be welcomed and catered for, no matter what her or his abilities or disabilities. And then lastly, it's about the way in which the schools are run. And to me, it starts with the, the lead teacher, the principal, uh, the head teacher, because they set the tone for the school. And the schools that do the best welcome parents and communities into the process and make them a partner. Because we all know that actually, if a child's going to read, it starts at home. You know, how much are children spoken to? How much access to books do they have at home? Are their parents able to read to them? Um, is anyone talking to them at all? So it really is a partnership effort. But that whole package, what it will get to get 10-year-olds reading, needs all of that to happen together. Yeah. And if you think of it this way, um, the SDGs, uh, 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 we have to achieve them by 2030. So the kids being born today will be the 10-year-olds who have to be reading by 2030. Okay, have to be reading. I'm gonna take us to a quick film that talks about the importance of literacy. And then we're gonna take questions, uh, either from the audience or from our online audience. So get ready. Um, let's cut to the video. For more than half of children in developing countries, this is what the world looks like. We are in the midst of a learning crisis that's leaving children unable to read and unprepared for the future. That's why we've set a goal of reducing by at least half the share of children who cannot read and understand a simple story by the age of 10 by 2030. Help us call attention to this issue because literacy makes sense for everyone. For more than half... Okay, um, I'm, I have time to take one question, maybe? <laughs> Is that what I'm getting? Yes, sir. From the audience? Yes, oh, thank you very much for the session. Uh, can we get a mic here? Thank you. I can read, but I can't speak loud enough, obviously. <laughs> uh, thank you all uh, for your remarks, uh, and thank the bank for uh, its attention to this important issue. Certainly all of us agree reading is important. I guess my question for the panel, though, is why is reading focused on the development of a narrow notion of human capital that focuses on worker productivity rather than the development of human capabilities that go across areas. Our friend from Albania talked about the involvement of, of youth and, 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 and people talked about the involvement of parents in, in schooling. Education isn't just about preparing for the workforce. Why does this report narrowly conceive of the goals of education? Yeah. Um, Annette, do you want to take that question? Look, I think there's a universal consensus that education is uh, 
valued in its own right. It's fundamental to our ability to participate in the, the full life of the society. And it's not limited to um, uh, uh, an economic kind of drive. Having said that, we also know it is critical for the development of countries. You know, and it's only in recent years that we've actually been able to measure and quantify how critical it is. You know, for years, economists measured wealth uh, in a fairly narrow way around productive capital. Then we started measuring natural capital, the wealth that's endowed in, in land and natural resources. It's only in recent times that we've actually been looking at how much wealth is endowed in people. And it's important for policymakers to understand that because they don't see it. This wealth is inside the heads of their children. And you know, if you're making a policy choice, do we build some infrastructure or do we invest more in education? It's hard to see the tangible results of that unless organizations like the World Bank start to quantify why it is important to make that choice, not only as something which is valued in its own right, but because countries stop getting poor when their kids get educated, get healthy, and are at the accumulated uh, results of that actually helps to drive the development process. That's why it's so important. Right, as we wrap up, because our time is short, I want to do a lightning round where I go right down the row and ask you for one, I want one parting thought um, that you want to share that with this audience who are going to go out and tackle learning poverty in their countries. Um, it could be a suggestion. I want it to be specific. I want people to leave here with something actionable or something inspirational. And if it was tweetable, that'd be great too. So in sort of one sentence or less, if possible, um, what one inspirational thing do you are, or actionable thing do you want to leave with our audience? 22 years ago, I, was, I believed that children, regardless of their social and economic background, could understand, I mean, could learn how to read by six or seven years old. Today, I'm sure of that. All right. <clears throat> My mother grew up in a poor family. Um, she had uh, only primary education, but she learned to read. Uh, 10 years ago, she had a massive stroke, which actually she survived. Uh, and her one remaining disability when she recovered was that she could no longer read. It meant she lost her independence. She could not use a, cell, a, a telephone, a cell phone. She couldn't read the newspaper. She couldn't write a check. And she could no longer live alone. She lost her independence completely. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I truly don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> you better tell these um, finance ministers what they need to do. You know? Um, happy teachers. Happy teachers. <laughs> it's worth it. Henrietta. Learning to read empowers a girl and empowers a boy. Minister Kani. Tous parents aspire. All parents want their children to live better than they live. I wish that for my children and my grandchildren. Um, Nelson Mandela said, education is the greatest weapon we have for changing the world. So let's work together to put that weapon in the hands of children like Angela to achieve change. All right. <laughs> now, I'll share what I said earlier. When children can read, children can lead. Join me in thanking my panelists uh, for a great conversation today.